Hey, what's up everybody? It's Mr. White here with some notes for you about fiscal policy. So these are going to be our very first notes uh, in chapter four. So you want to follow along and uh, if you have any questions about this, of course, just make sure you email or text or you could just ask me in class. So here we go. Let's talk about fiscal policy, which is all about how the government attempts to influence economic performance through the use of taxes and government spending. Now, before we get into this, uh, you know, when I said how the government attempts to influence economic performance, you may have fallen back on what you learned in U.S. history, uh, which is the idea that in a free market, the government shouldn't play any role in the economy. Right. Remember our uh, good friend Adam Smith, the father of capitalism. Uh, he is the guy who famously said laissez faire. Let it be. Uh, he believed that the market uh, itself was enough to to regulate the economy like we don't need the the government to tell us what to do we can make our own decisions based on our own self-interest remember that's called the invisible hand so uh, most people refer to this idea as classical economics uh, the idea that markets should be allowed to regulate themselves uh, the idea that the government doesn't really have any legitimate role to play and that most of the time when the government gets involved in the economy it tends to screw things up well, that was the prevailing wisdom. That's what everybody believed, basically, all the way up until the 1930s. Now, you might remember that in the 1930s, there was a little something that came around called the Great Depression. The Great Depression was not the only depression or the only economic downturn we'd ever had, but the thing was that throughout the 1800s, there had been a series of these depressions, and the Great Depression was like you know the last really big one. And, and around that time, we decided to make some big changes to how we understand the economy and, and not just how we understand the economy, but how we understand government's role in the economy. Now, most people thought that the market would return back to equilibrium on its own, but we know that the Great Depression lasted for years and years. And so there were some who started to question, you know, well, how long is it going to take for the market to return back to normal or to return back to equilibrium. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, there was one prominent economist at the time, this guy here, John Maynard Keynes. I know it looks like Keynes, but it's pronounced Keynes. John Maynard Keynes, whenever somebody would tell him that the economy would return back to normal in the long run, uh, he had sort of a, a quippy remark. He would say, ah, yes, but in the long run, we're all dead. You know, what he really meant by that is that, yeah, of course, the economy will eventually return back to normal. We know, we know that. We understand that. But how long is that going to take? And in the meantime, you got to understand there are real people suffering. And so Keynes believed that when spending in the economy is too low or too high, it either causes unemployment to increase or inflation to increase. Uh, and so really, this guy is kind of like the founding father of what we call macroeconomics. Uh, as a matter of fact, he's one of the very first people to uh, identify and define that thing that we just studied called the business cycle. And, and so Keynes became an advisor to Roosevelt. And, and what he decided was a good idea was that he thought we could use government policies to help end the Great Depression. Uh, this became what is known as Keynesian economics. So from now on, guys, if you ever hear that term Keynesian economics, we're talking about this guy, John Maynard Keynes, and his idea that the government not only has a responsibility, but also an ability to fix the economy when things go wrong. And so what Keynes said was that government should spend more and encourage people to buy more goods and services by doing stuff like cutting their taxes. I mean, it makes sense if the government cuts your taxes, you get more money in your paycheck. And we know that when people get more money in their paycheck, what are they going to do with it? Well, they're going to spend it. If people go out and spend their money, even if the economy is doing bad, all of a sudden businesses start getting busier. When businesses get busier, uh, they probably have to hire people. And if the businesses hire more people, well, then that sort of helps solve that problem of unemployment. And so, um, you know, Keynes became one of the most celebrated economists of all time. And all throughout the 1950s and 60s, governments around the world were using this idea of Keynesian economics. Now, the reason why Keynesian economics works so well is because of something that economists call the multiplier effect. This is just the idea that every dollar of spending in the economy creates more than one dollar of economic activity. Just, just think of it as when you spend money in the economy, it, it basically creates a ripple effect. It's kind of like if you're standing in front of a big puddle and you've got a pebble in your hand. We know that if you throw the pebble into the puddle, the pebble only physically touches one small part of that big old puddle. 
but the ripples from that pebble will extend across the entire puddle. And so basically that one little pebble can affect the entire enormous puddle. Um, that's the idea when you spend in the economy, your money ripples throughout the economy and causes people to spend money and buy things and produce things that wouldn't have been produced otherwise. Let me give you an example. Let's say you just got your paycheck and you decided to go to the mall, and buy yourself some new clothes, okay? Well, here's the thing. When you go to the mall and buy new clothes, what do you have to give them? That's pretty simple, right? You gotta give them some money. When you pay for your clothes and you give that cash to the people at the store, what happens to your money after you leave? Do you think your money just stays in the store forever and just sort of collects dust over time? No, of course not, right? What does the store use the money for? Well, they, they use it to buy more clothes and they use it to pay their employees and to, to pay the rent on the space that they have in the mall. And, and so basically your money just gets divided up and handed out to other people. Well, when other people get that money, what do they do with it? Yeah, they go spend it, right? So maybe the cashier at the store where you bought your clothes, uh, maybe he decides on the weekend he's gonna use his paycheck to go to the movie theater. So he goes and buys a ticket at the local movie theater. Well, when that cashier spends the money that he got from work at the movie theater, the movie theater gets money and, and what's the movie theater gonna do with it? Right? It's not gonna just sit in the movie theater forever. They're gonna spend it. They're gonna buy more popcorn. They're gonna pay for the next movie. They're gonna pay their employees. And so once again, the money gets divided up. It gets handed out to more people. And then those people are gonna use it to buy other stuff on and on and on and on. And, and that's what the multiplier effect is. You know, If you remember that circular flow model that we learned way back in unit one and that game we played, that circular flow game, remember that one person's spending is another person's income. So when one person goes out and spends money in the economy, it makes sense that somebody else in the economy just earns some money. And when somebody earns money, they go spend it, which means that somebody else is gonna earn some income. And then they're gonna go spend it, and then somebody else is gonna earn some income. On and on and on. And so that's why fiscal policy is a way that the government can cause an effect to the whole economy. If they cut your taxes, you're gonna go spend more, which means other people are gonna earn more income and they're gonna spend more. And hopefully that can correct any kind of an economic problem we have, like a recession. Now. When I said that fiscal policy is based off changing government spending and taxes, that's basically it. I mean, it's, it's pretty easy, right? Fiscal policy is just the use of government spending and taxes, meaning like revenue collection and government expenditures to influence economic activity. Um, fiscal policy at its source is controlled by Congress because Congress is the one that, uh, as you may remember from your government class, has the power of the purse, meaning that they're the ones who get to decide what the federal government spends money on. But of course, we know when Congress passes a bill, it lands on the desk of the president. And the president has to sign that bill into law before it can actually take effect. And so what that means is that even though fiscal policy is mostly under the direction of Congress, the president is the guy who has the final say. Uh, you may remember that Harry Truman said the buck stops here, right? It's kind of how it goes. So the tools of the federal government essentially are just two things. Like in terms of affecting the economy, the government can raise or lower taxes and the government can increase or decrease government spending. And so any of those things could have a big impact on our economy as a whole. So even though fiscal policy proved really effective during the Great Depression, and you know, uh, Keynes advised Roosevelt to do that program called the New Deal, where they built roads and libraries and bridges, and they created social safety net programs like unemployment insurance and uh, social security. Hopefully you remember learning about that in US history. Um, you know, and, and fiscal policy became really a, a well-used tool by governments all over the world. A lot of people point out that fiscal policy, while it's good, is not perfect. Uh, there's a lot of hurdles or, or problems that get in the way of making fiscal policy work really as it's intended. One of the biggest problems is that it takes a long time. Uh, you know, honestly, it takes a long time for our Congress to do just about anything, but when it comes to questions that are as complicated as the economy, it can take twice as long. You know, for one thing, most people in Congress are not trained economists, so it can take them a long time to even realize there's a problem. 
then they have to come up with a solution to the problem, which once again, since most of them are not economists, that can take a while because they got to figure out who should they get good advice from to be able to solve this problem. Then, assuming they can come up with a solution that everybody agrees on, they actually have to pass the bill, meaning they have to like enact some legislation. Uh, and this can be particularly difficult because of the fact that the you know it's really hard for the government to increase or decrease spending most of the time because the majority of all government spending is on entitlements and different social programs uh, which cannot be changed very easily so in other words we're already spending all the money we have on all the programs we're already doing so if we want to add new programs like like doing some expansionary fiscal policy program like building new roads uh, it generally means the government has to borrow money to make that happen that kind of explains why our government's in so much debt. Now, another huge problem of fiscal policy, which we haven't talked about, but I'm sure you were thinking about, is political party cooperation. You know, these days, Republicans and Democrats don't agree on pretty much anything. Uh, you can imagine when it comes to questions of the economy, uh, that is no different. So if the Republicans are in power, they're going to face a lot of pushback from the Democrats on anything that they want to do to try to help the economy and vice versa. If the Democrats find themselves in control of Congress, uh, pretty much any economic proposals they come up with are going to face a lot of opposition from Republicans. And then the last thing is that when the government enacts fiscal policy, they got to be careful not to overcorrect the problem. You know, in other words, cutting taxes will get people to spend money and, and that might help with the problem of unemployment. But you got to be careful not to cut taxes too much. Uh, if you cut taxes too much, you're going to overcorrect the problem. You're going to get people to spend way too much money. And then, you know, maybe you'll have a big problem with inflation or you might run into trouble getting uh, all those other programs we're already enacting paid for if you cut taxes too much. And so it might make it harder for the government to, to live up to the obligations they already have if they decide to take on new obligations in the form of more federal spending or lower taxes. Now, when it comes to fiscal policy, there's basically two types. You've got automatic and you got discretionary. Now, automatic, obviously, I think we all know what that means, right? But discretion hopefully most of you know what that means if, if you don't know the term discretion just means making a smart choice or making an educated choice that's why when you have those shows that have you know violence or nudity right at the beginning of the show what does it always say parental discretion is advised but if you never knew what that actually meant it just means parents make a smart choice there's about to be some nudity or some violence or some salty language so make a make a smart choice about whether or not your kids should watch the show that's about to come on so when we say that fiscal policy is discretionary, we mean that Congress is making an active choice. So automatic fiscal policy is where Congress doesn't have to make a choice, okay? So that's really the big thing I want you to remember if you see questions about automatic or discretionary fiscal policy. Automatic fiscal policy just happens. It's based off of laws that were passed a long time ago. Um, so there are laws that were passed 10, 20, you know, maybe even 120 years ago that uh, will, change taxes or spending automatically in response to changes in GDP or in responses to government income or people's income. There's all kinds of different things. But one way or another, it, it means that government taxes or spending are just going to change on their own because of what's already happening in the economy. Um, okay, so I realize that might be kind of confusing. Let me give you an example. Um, let's say that the economy's in a recession. You know, we're, we're in a time where the whole economy is doing bad and everybody's losing their jobs, not because they're not needed or not because they're looking for a better job, but just because the economy is in a slump. Maybe you remember we call that cyclical unemployment. Well, if a person loses their job through no fault of their own, you know, because of something like cyclical unemployment, they can automatically apply for what are called unemployment insurance benefits uh, to help keep them afloat essentially while looking for a new job you know what it means if you've never heard of this before unemployment insurance is a program that the government pays for where people who lose their job through no fault of their own can get usually up to 80 percent of their normal pay while they look for a new job um, so like let's say for example if, if you were working at a, a grocery store and you were a full-time worker and the whole economy just sucks and so nobody's at the grocery store nobody's shopping there and so since nobody's shopping there maybe your boss comes to you one day and says look you know you're a great worker we really appreciate you and when the economy's better come back and we'll hire you back but for right now we have to let you go just because we don't have enough customers well let's say if you were making a thousand dollars a week at this grocery store i know it's a pretty good paycheck but remember you're working full-time um 
you could go down to the local unemployment insurance office and you could apply. And of course, they're going to check up on your story and make sure that the reason why you're not working there is because you literally were laid off. Uh, but as long as what you're saying is true, they'll give you about 80% of what you were making. So instead of getting $1,000 a week, well, now you're going to get $800 a week, but that's still pretty good. Uh, and that $800 a week is to help you out while you look for a new job. Uh, because we know that when there's a lot of cyclical unemployment, we're in a recession, there's not a lot of jobs, it might take you a long time to find a job. And the government wants to make sure that you've got some money in your pocket so you can continue buying things during this downturn. Now, here's the thing. We said that if people get money, they go spend money. And when Somebody spends money, somebody else earns income. Uh, and when that person gets income, they spend money. Remember that multiplier effect? Well, the idea is that if the government wants to help the economy during a recession, they want to create the multiplier effect. And unemployment insurance is an automatic way that that happens. Just think, when the economy goes down, more people qualify for unemployment insurance. And so government spending on unemployment insurance goes up, right? Makes sense. So increase in government spending, that's exactly what we would expect to see. If the economy is doing better, let's say if we're in an expansion phase, fewer people can qualify for unemployment insurance. And so government spending on this program goes down, right? Automatically. Congress doesn't have to pass a law. Nothing has to happen. Guys, this is a law that was passed during the Great Depression, but it's still in effect. Another great example, if you're thinking on the tax side, is the tax code we have. We have a progressive tax code. Uh, you may remember that progressive taxes just means that when your income changes, the amount you owe in taxes change. Uh, what I always say is the more money you make, the more money they take. Because the higher your income goes, the higher the percentage you pay in tax. For example, if you only make $10,000 a year, you pay 10% of your income in tax. But if you make a half a million dollars a year, you pay close to 40% of your income in tax. So the more money you make, the more money they take. That means that when we're in a recession, everybody's paychecks are going down, right? If everybody's paychecks are going down, the amount they owe in taxes is also going down, right? In an expansion, everybody's paychecks are going up, and so the amount that everybody pays in taxes goes up. And all of that happens automatically. What's crazy about this law, the progressive tax law, it was passed way back in, huh? what did you think, 19 something? No, 1863, guys. It was passed during the Civil War. It was actually Abraham Lincoln who signed that into law. So you can see how these are automatic because they're already passed into law. They're already there. And so whenever the economy changes, these things happen automatically and change government spending or taxes automatically. Now, discretionary fiscal policy just means Congress has to actually make a decision and do something, and the president has to sign it into law. This is a government policy change. So this requires an act of Congress. Anytime you see a question where it says Congress decides to do this, Congress decides to do that. Basically, guys, if the word Congress is in that question, it's almost certainly going to be a discretionary policy action because it means that Congress is going to actually have to debate a law, pass it, and then, of course, get the the president to sign it into law. Um, now, there can be two different kinds of discretionary fiscal policy. Uh, if they want the economy to speed up, they do an expansionary policy. And if they want the economy to slow down, they do a contractionary policy. So remember, discretion means making a choice. A discretionary fiscal policy is where Congress makes a choice to change taxes or spending in response to some sort of a problem in the economy. So, for example, the New Deal was a discretionary fiscal policy, and it was an expansionary discretionary fiscal policy. Now, to understand this, you got to remember that whole business cycle thing that we just studied. Remember, the business cycle is the graph that measures changes in real GDP over time. So that's why we got real GDP on the y-axis and we've got time down there on the x-axis. That yellow line measures the level of real GDP at different periods of time. So, you know, there are some periods of time where real GDP is going up. Uh, when real GDP is going up, we call that an expansion. And then there are some periods of time where real GDP is going down. And when real GDP is going down, we call that a contraction or a recession if it lasts for a really long time. Now, when we're in a contraction or a recession, since real GDP is going down, that's a bit of a problem, right? When real GDP is going down, that means that businesses are producing less stuff. When businesses are producing less stuff, they don't need as many factors of production. And of course, we know 
that means they don't need as much labor because labor is a factor of production. So unemployment starts to rise. That's the big problem that we have in a contraction or a recession. Too many people are losing their jobs. And so the government wants to try to get the economy to expand again to start growing, to start producing more stuff so that more people can get jobs. And so since they want the economy to expand, that's why they use an expansionary policy. Now, one thing you're gonna notice that's kind of tricky here is that whatever phase of the business cycle we're currently in, the type of policy we're gonna do always has the opposite name. And so you can see we're in a contraction, we wanna use expansionary policy. Now, expansionary policy means the government's gonna decrease taxes, when you decrease taxes, that puts more money in people's pockets and that increases consumer spending. They're also going to increase government spending, meaning they're going to do more programs like building roads and you know constructing schools, hiring teachers, you know, all the things that I like, right? Um, but the bad thing about doing all that stuff, even though that's going to have a great effect on growing the economy and getting real GDP to rise once again, it leads to what's known as a deficit budget, okay? Deficit means where the government spends more money than they make, and deficits lead to debt. Now, the other kind of fiscal policy that we would use is during an expansion phase. In the expansion phase, remember that inflation can become a problem. Prices can rise too quickly, and so that's why we would use a contractionary fiscal policy. Um, contractionary fiscal policy doesn't mean that we want the economy to go into a contraction. It simply just means we want to slow down the expansion phase. But once again, you're going to notice that the type of policy we use always has the opposite name to the phase of the business cycle that we're in. That's a very important rule that you need to remember. If you can remember that rule, it makes your life a lot easier when you're trying to answer questions on a quiz or a test or a worksheet. Okay. Now, with contractionary fiscal policy, since we're trying to slow down economic growth, what we're going to do is increase taxes. That means that we're going to take more money out of people's paychecks. It makes it harder for them to spend money. And if it's harder for people to spend money, remember that slows down demand pull inflation. We learned about inflation in the last unit. We said that when people spend too much money, all the extra demand for all those products forces businesses to raise their prices. And so if we can slow people down from buying stuff, businesses hopefully won't raise their prices as much. Now, the other thing we can do is decrease government spending. So don't do as many programs. Don't build as many roads. Don't build as many schools. Fire some of those teachers. I don't really like that very much. But if our economy is, uh, you know, a little bit overheated, if we're having too much spending, then that's the, the real uh, medicine that we need. And so in this case, it would actually create a surplus budget. Even though all these things sound kind of nasty in the short run, the nice thing is that with a surplus budget, the government brings in more money than it spends. And so that can help us pay off all that debt that we have. Now, to think about this in another way, we can imagine some analogies. I like analogies. And let's, let's think of an analogy of our economy as a car. Um, so I'm gonna put an E on the side of this car for the economy. Okay, so uh, if the economy is moving a little bit too slow, like the guy in this political cartoon here, you see he's just enjoying his music, just going at his own pace. Uh, but of course, you can see all the people behind him are a little bit impatient, trying to get him to move a bit faster. You know, if the economy is going too slow, all of us feel like those guys in the car behind him, right? We want the economy to go faster because when the economy is too slow, everybody's losing jobs, everybody's losing money, businesses are closing down. So. If the government wants to make this guy speed up, they can just tell him step on the gas, right? And, and so what can the government do to step on the gas? How can we get the economy moving? Well, that's what expansionary fiscal policy is designed to do. We wanna get our car moving faster. So here's what we do. When we're in a contraction or a recession of the economy, GDP is too low, right? Remember that with a recession phase, GDP is going down, right? This number is decreasing. When GDP is going down, people are losing jobs because businesses aren't producing as much. And if businesses aren't producing as much, then we don't need as many workers. So unemployment starts going higher. And this is all because of low consumer spending. You know, if we could just get people to spend more money, businesses would have to hire more people because they'd have to produce more stuff to meet all that extra demand. So the idea of an expansionary policy is to correct this, to give people more money so they'll go buy more stuff. And when people buy more stuff, businesses hire more people and that fixes our unemployment problem. So here's a little chart to show you what I'm talking about. Uh, if we wanna move the economy out of a contraction or a recession phase, consumer spending needs to increase. So what we're gonna do with taxes is we're gonna cut them. We cut taxes, 
puts more money in people's pockets, and so people go spend more money. So consumer spending will increase. But the problem is that when you cut taxes, that's less money coming into the government. That's how the government gets their money to do all the stuff they do. So it's like they're taking in less income. And at the same time, they're going to be spending more, right? We said to expand the economy, government spending needs to increase. When government spending increases, just think they got to pay construction workers and teachers and firefighters. When people get money, what do they do with it? They spend it, right? And when they spend it, that just increases more economic activity. That's, that's why the government spends more money during this time. But the problem is, once again, if the government's going to spend more money at the same time as they're bringing in less money through taxes, they're going to have to borrow. And, and that's, once again, why we're in a deficit budget. Remember that a deficit budget is when the government spends more money than it brings in. This would be like if your boss cuts your hours at work, and so now you're only making like, uh, let's say, 100 bucks a week at work, but you decide that every week you're going to go to the mall and buy a new pair of Jordans that cost $200. Well, here's the thing. If you just do the math, it's pretty simple math. If you're only making $100 a week, but you're spending $200 a week, you're going to be in debt by $100 a week every single week. So by the end of the month, you're $400 in debt. And if you keep doing that month after month after month, you're going to find yourself in a whole lot of debt. Unfortunately, that's kind of the way that our government does things, because if you can imagine, our government likes expansionary policy more than contractionary policy. Go, go figure, right? Now, contractionary policy doesn't mean we want to stop the car from going forward. It just means we need to slow it down. Kind of like when you're driving a little too fast and you see this guy on the side of the road, right? Well, if you're driving too fast and you see a cop on the side of the road, you're not going to slam on the brakes and stop your car right? That would be crazy. You're going to definitely get a ticket then. Probably going to cause an accident too. Um, but the idea is that you just want to bring the car back to a normal speed because if you go a little too fast, you're going to get in trouble with inflation. So don't think of, uh, in this case, don't think of it as a cop. Think of it as inflation. Okay, we're going to think of this guy here as inflation. So we need to slow down our car so we don't get in trouble with inflation. Now, we use a contractionary policy during the expansionary phase. Remember I said that the policy always has the opposite name of the phase. What we need to do is GDP is a little too high because people are spending too much. The reason why people are spending too much is because unemployment is really, really low at this point. And when consumer spending is too high, it causes demand pull inflation. Inflation is the problem. Well, why is inflation a problem? You guys might remember that when prices are rising faster than people's paychecks, then their standard of living is going to suffer. You can't afford to buy all the stuff you need or all the stuff you want if everything is costing more than it used to cost. So the government wants to keep inflation low so that people can afford to still buy all the things they need and all the things they want. So here's what it looks like if we lay it out on a table, right? The government wants to solve the problem of inflation. They need to cut consumer spending. They need to make consumer spending decrease. What they're going to do is they're going to contract the economy by increasing taxes and decreasing government spending. When they increase taxes, what that's going to do is that takes more money out of people's paychecks. When people don't have money in their paychecks, they can't buy stuff. And when people can't buy stuff, that's going to make businesses have to cut their prices. Just think about it. If you're a business and you're seeing fewer customers and you're trying to still sell your product, you might have to cut your prices and have a sale. A sale is a really good way to encourage more customers to come in. So, because of the fact that consumer spending decreases, prices should decrease. Government spending will also uh, decrease, right? When government spending decreases, that means less money going in the pockets of teachers and firefighters and construction workers. When those people get less income, they do less spending. Less spending leads to lower prices. And I guess you could say the one silver lining is that if we do this, we're going to have a surplus budget, meaning the government's going to bring in more money because they're taxing more, and they're going to spend less money because of the fact that they're cutting government spending programs. And so if you're somebody who really cares about fixing our, our debt, right, which a lot of people seem to be really concerned about the national debt these days, well, then this is exactly what needs to happen is a contractionary fiscal policy. But the, the key is you got to be really careful. You don't want to raise taxes too much or cut government spending too much because that could also have a really bad effect on the economy. And we'll talk about that at a later date. So here is our final summary of expansionary and contractionary fiscal policy. Remember that with expansionary policy, that's what we want to use during the contraction phase of the business cycle. And the whole point is to fight unemployment. We're trying to get more people to work again. Government's going to 
uh, decrease taxes and they're going to increase spending on programs. All that will help increase consumer spending and that will hopefully get the GDP to rise again, which will get our economy back on track. When we find ourselves in an expansion phase of the economy, that's when we need to use a contractionary policy. A contractionary policy is designed to fight inflation. Remember, inflation is when prices are rising too quickly. So what we're going to do is we're going to increase taxes and decrease government spending. If you increase taxes, that takes money out of people's paychecks. They can't buy as much, and so they don't spend as much, right? Uh, and when you decrease government spending, once again, less money going to teachers, firefighters, people like that, less spending, lower prices. All right, guys, so that is it for our notes about fiscal policy. If you have any questions, like I said, you can email or you can put comments on this video or you can just ask me in class. All right, guys, see you next time.